Chang Wan Wan Er, visiting Princess Chang Ning's pool, number seventeen. Cliffs and gorges to climb to heart's content, delighting the eye, while also rejoicing the heart. The wind in bamboo is like a transverse flute. Flowing waters stand in for the music of lutes. Okay, so we continue with examples of Tang female poetry. Shang Wan Wan Er is probably one of the most important and famous Tang female poets. So before we comment on this work or in the biography of Shang Wan Wan Er herself, we need to do probably a little backup and explain the context of Tang female poetry. Okay. So, um, going back to the origins of Chinese culture, Chinese culture is a bit like most cultures in the world that have generally relegated women to a more reserved or more private sphere. And, 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 you know, this is not unusual. This happens, as I said, in almost all cultures in the world, perhaps just a little bit less in the West. In the case of China, if you think of like, like really old texts about the, the roles of male and female, Mm, members of society, like the classics, the Western Zhou philosophical treatises, Confucius. There's this <coughs> idea that, you know, the, the cosmos is a series of dualities, jing jiang, and, um, and uh, men and women are pieces of, of, that, of, of that system of duality. So men are traditionally associated with a yang force. They are active, they are um, warm, they are um, expansive, outwardly expansive. Women are associated with yin, with the moon, with water, with coldness, with receptivity, with, pass with passive attributes. And, you know, these philosophical, theoretical um, visions tend to play out um, in Chinese culture, but they don't do so in an static way. You know, the, these things change with time. So, for example, during the, the, the period of this union from 200 to about uh, 580 something of our era, uh, women generally enjoyed a greater degree of freedom than they would later. And um, the autonomy and, uh, in, and freedom of women would continuously continue to decline uh, afterwards. Uh, a watershed is usually the Song Dynasty, which is when foot binding became mandatory and when Neo Confucianism, a new revival, and rigorization of, of Confucius's principles strictly mandated that women were to be kept in the house and away from people who were not their husbands. Okay, so with this background, let's go to the start of the Tang Dynasty. Now, the, the Tang Dynasty, in some aspects, um, reinforced these traditional philosophical tropes about women's positions in society. On the other hand, at least from a practical perspective, it also undermined them. So the Tang unified the empire, and part of this unification was restoring and mandating traditional values, especially the ritualistic texts and their values of women in the private sphere, women in the home, women not making themselves visible or interacting with men who are not men of the household. So, so the Tang did a lot to infuse new life on these preconceptions and views of what women should do. On the other hand, the Tang, especially in the early years, witnessed a series of very powerful female figures uh, who had a lot of power in the court. Uh, the most famous ones would be obviously Empress Wu Zetian, the concubine and then Empress of Emperor Gaozong, who after her husband's death and some regency over her, her children, actually usurped the imperial prerogative and proclaimed herself Empress. Now, not widow of an emperor or wife of an emperor, but Empress in her own right. And then and, and instaurated a very brief dynasty, the, 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 uh, it was the uh, Zhou dynasty. And there were other very important um, princesses, uh, courtiers, you know, people like Empress Wei, Princess Taiping, Princess An Le. Um, in its origins, the Tang dynasty came from um, the northwest of China and from a background of mixed ethnic, Turkic, and Chinese. Uh, ancestry, which meant they had these more open cultural mores about women 
that barbarians had as respect as with, 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 as, as contrasted with the Chinese attitude. So, so this also influenced in, in women having a little bit more freedom, autonomy, power, but especially if they were rich upper class women, aristocracy or members of the imperial family. Okay, so with this background, so we have to think also about poetry. Um, in the examples that we've been seeing of poetry, the main purpose and the main context in which poetry is created in the Tang Dynasty is in the context of scholar officials. Poetry is not a private event. It's not like something an individual mostly does in private. The tradition of Chinese poetry, still mm, working at this time, tends to focus on poetry's public function. Uh, from the Analects, poetry expresses what's in the heart intently. There's this idea that poetry is expressivist, but not expressivist mainly in the sense of an individual making his feelings known, but rather in the sense of an individual making public virtuous criticism and praise known. That is political sort of feelings and views of the world. And this, you know, matches very well with the idea that it's scholar officials who mostly should compose poetry. So add these two things. Poetry in the Tang is mainly the creation of scholar officials, which is meant to, a lot of the times, have political overtones, whether explicit or implicit. And it's a social, a social event. Poetry is composed even extemporaneously in groups of, of courtiers or among the literati. So we have this. And uh, this public nature of poetry jars with the presumed private sphere in, to which women are relegated. Even if it's not that strictly enforced in the Tang, it's, you know, it's relatively strictly enforced. All of this would go to explaining why there are so few Tang female poets and um, the fact that the few that there are in their poems, at least the ones that have been preserved, generally tend to belong to three types of groups of, 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 of Tang women. Uh, group one, the first basket, and Shang Wan Wan Er, the poet we're going to be talking about today, falls into this first category, is um, aristocrats, mm, empresses, mm, members of the highest uh, social spheres. Especially in the early Tang period when these mm, women, powerful aristocratic women, had a lot of power, um, they, they dabbled in affairs of the court, they acted uh, as courtiers, and this means that they, they did the activities that courtiers were expected to do, including composing poetry. So these are women that are unusually in the public sphere because of, you know, of their high social class or of their imperial uh, blood. So we have some poems from this, these sorts of women. Second category are courtesans. So um, courtesans existed during the Tang. They were a little bit like you would imagine um, Japanese geisha or classical Greek hetairai. They were high, high, highly <laughs> educated entertainers for the aristocracy and for the scholar officials. They lived in a quarter in the capital, very close to the university and the imperial palace, the Pingyang Ward. And they basically didn't step out of that place. They stayed there for almost all of their lives. And, you know, they were meant to be paid, pleasant companion for the intellectuals. As such, they were educated in, in most of the arts, in party games, jokes, but also refined conversation and poetry. And, you know, they, they were able to compose poetry and they, they, their relationships with their clients included, or at least to some extent included, romance and perhaps sex. But the main focus was on, you know, this veneer of, of affection and culture. So there, there are a lot of famous courtesans that had poetic interchanges with men. Generally, the type of poems they make are always love poetry of, of this sort. So, so not the, the sort of high Confucian sort of poetry. So this is the second basket, and we will be talking about some poets, female poets that fall into this. The most famous Tang female poet is like this, Xue Tao. And finally, there's a third basket. The third basket is Taoist priestesses. Taoism had been um, made official already in, 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 in the period of this union, but it became more like an organized, well-established church in the last centuries of this union. The Tang were big patrons of Taoism, as they claimed to descend from Lao Tzu. And Taoism uh, uh, had nuns, but these nuns were not, in spite of the name, they're not that much like Western nuns. They were women that had that didn't have to get married. They had a big amount of freedom and wealth. 
And uh, some of them were beautiful, and you know th this was you know, um, highlighted, it wasn't something to be hidden. And they had romantic and sentimental alliances, so they were, in a certain way, a different type of, of courtesan. And uh, there's a very famous Tang poetess who, who was a Taoist nun. We've already talked about one, I think, Li Ji. There's another one um, that we will talk in the future, Yu Xuanji. Okay, so now we've given all this background to female poetry. This is going to be a slightly longer video than usual. So now let's jump into Shang Guan Wan'e. So Shang Guan Wan'e is the typical example of the first basket. She is the courtier, the, the female courtier. She lives in like the, 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 the second half of the 7th century, early years of the 8th century. Granddaughter of an important courtier and poet himself, Shang Guan Ji of the very early Tang. So um, she worked in the service of Empress Wu, and uh, you know when she was young, I think her parents were executed, her father and brothers maybe, and she and her mother, you know, became slaves in the imperial quarters. She very early showed good literary and political skills, and uh, uh, this means that she very early started rising in the estimation of Empress Wu and becoming a drafter of edicts and other documents for the empress, even though she had some minor hiccups, in one of which she was um, sentenced to death, and that sentence commuted for tattooing on her face. After that, she continued writing, and, you know, she, she became a right-hand woman of sorts for Empress Wu, and later for uh, one of her sons after Empress Wu died, Emperor Chongzong. And in the end, she was executed in the early years of, uh, of, 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 of the 8th century, um, after the conspiracies of Empress Wei were discovered, and you know, she was considered a party or, or a collaborator of Empress Wei. So, very, very important person in the Emperor Wu, Empress Wu Zetian's court. Um, during, also under Emperor Chongzong, she was officially ranked a consort of the emperor, one of the many hundreds of them, but well, she was an imperial consort. She was a patron of sorts of most of the early Tang poets, famous people that we've talked about, like Li Jiao, Shen Chuan Qi, Song Ji Wen, Du Shen Yan, and she was a great early Tang poet herself. Now, early Tang poetry, I think we've mentioned this a couple of times in previous videos, it's not like the best period for Tang poetry, it's the aristocratic era, continuing the practices and the values of the late uh, Six Dynasties. This is a poetry that is mostly, we would call it, refined, effet, superficial, aristocratic, rococo. It's the sort of poems that are composed uh, to celebrate parties and visits to aristocratic states, or to make poems rhyming the emperor's poems and his rhymes. The sort of, you know, really fancy, superficial uh, type of poetry without serious moral intent. Okay, so this is uh, Shang Wan Wan Er. Uh, I think that's most of what we can say about her. 32 of her poems have survived in the Chuan Tan Shi, and uh, they fall basically into three categories lyric poems, chord poems, landscape poems. The poem we've read today is one of the landscape poems. It's part of a series of uh, I think it's 25 poems. And, you know, as you can see from the title, Visiting Princess Changning's Pool, it's, you know, a series of poems composed, uh, you know, for a visit to, to an estate. So Princess Changning is some aristocratic member of the imperial family. And uh, this poem, these series of poems are, you know, descriptive landscape poems that describe the wonderful, luxurious, beautiful, pond and the state that this Princess Changning would have. So a very typical, this is not exactly courtly poetry, but it's a close adjacent. It's a very typical poetry of the early Tang, a poetry describing some aristocratic estate. And the poem is, you know, quite straight. You know, it doesn't have much levels of complication or overtones. It's a pentasyllabic quatrain, which is like the, the shortest um, form imagin imaginable, and it's just describing a beautiful locus amoenus, a, a wonderful estate, uh, a place where nature has um, a, a really strong impact on the person, and where a mix of nature and cultural images are blended to create this 
wonderful effect of you know this delightful natural space infused with social and cultural activities. So the first couplet, well, all of the poem is rather descriptive, but first couplet, cliffs and gorges to climb to heart's content, delighting the eye while also rejoicing the heart. So we're in the pool, we're in the state. The first thing the poetic persona of uh, Shang Wan Wan Er sees, and literally, because the first couplet is about seeing, is cliffs and gorges. So landscape poetry is described as uh, Shan Shui. That's another name for, for that sort of poetry, which is um, mountains and rivers. And uh, they're, they're typical protagonists. Uh, also, you know, uh, one going up and stone and one going horizontally and water. And they're very good for the parallelistic antithesis that Chinese classical poetry likes so much. So here we're in the state. It's not the pool that gets described, it's the background view. And, you know, a lot of these states had a background on, they were on the outskirts of the imperial capitals, and so they had pretty nice background <laughs> landscapes of mountains, especially in Chang'an, if this is a poem that was written in Chang'an, which I do not know, to the south of Chang'an you have this mountain range, the Chongnan Mountains, which form a very effective um, um, background for any estate. So you have cliffs and gorges, you look at them, enough to fill your heart's content of desires for climbing them, for trekking down the mountains. Yeah? And you're, the, the poetic person is looking at them and they delight the eyes, because they're a beautiful sight of greenery and elevation, but also the heart, because they bring all those um, reverberations, all those overtones which we associate with mountains and mountain life and mountain climbing in China. Remember, insight, the retired life, etc. Purity, nature, the world of nature as opposed to the world of the court, etc. So the first couplet is visual, the second couplet is oral which is also a very typical contrast. Uh, so, so the first was focused on a sight of those mountains. The second is focused on sounds. Basically the sounds of wind and water in the, the, the estate. And those sounds of wind and water are paralleled to their equivalent ones in musical instruments. Yeah? The wind in bamboo is like a transverse flute. Flowing water stand in for the music of lutes. So we're in the garden, we can hear the wind blowing through a clatter, a clump of bamboo. Uh, we can see also the ripples, the sound of the flowing waters flowing around, and this brings to mind the sound of lutes in the case of the flowing waters, the sound of flutes in the case of the wind. These are pretty conventional um, uh, associations. Uh, that doesn't mean that they aren't aesthetically pleasing, but remember this sort of poetry uh, of the early Tang, of which Shang Wang Wan Er is a good representative, is this sort of pretty um, conventional poetry, you know, highly conventional in wording, in structure, even in stock phrases. Mm, but, yeah, okay, this, this is a very good example of that sort of, uh, of early Tang poetry. And that's all for the moment for Shang Wan Wan Er.